ambassador to the People's Republic of China, other parliamentarians, family of the late Winston White, ladies, gentlemen, friends. We are here this afternoon to pay our last respects to an outstanding son of St. Patrick, a father, husband, brother, friend. When I say friend, I mean genuine friend. Winston's friend was well, not about politics. We disagree on lots of issues, but we remain good friends. And so he was with many other persons in the political arena. So I want to take this opportunity to extend sincere condolences to his family, especially his children, and the extended family. I've been asked to say something about Winston within a particular context. And that context is the period he spent in detention. But I don't think I have the real authority to do that because Winston served, as far as I could recall, the longest period in prison as a detention. I can't think of any other person from October, the maybe others, but from October 79 until the American and Caribbean forces came in, he was liberated. The maybe others, but as far as I know, he spent almost four years as a political detainee. So now, what could I say about Winston in that respect? Winston did not come from the sky and fall in the prison as a political detainee. We have to be realistic. We have to put things in its context. Winston, because of his attributes as an orator, a man who mix and mingle with people, a very popular person in the community, when Winston leaves a test going to the east, he would stop at Montreux in the junction and talk to the boys, Hermitage, River Sally, wherever. And in my view, these attributes became a threat to the revolution. So in October 1979, Winston was picked up with the allegation of some plot. But everybody knew there was no plot. We have to be realistic and truthful. Winston was taken before this plot. Similarly, just as the the Catholic focus was closed down in the allegation of some plot. I mean, was there any plot by the Catholic authorities? I'm just showing you the, 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 the situation we had faced with at the time. And people remained silent for whatever reason. And some of these people masquerading as Christians and failing to understand that Jesus said, I came to be a witness to the truth. How could you be a witness to the truth in, and you're promoting and giving preference to a Marxist ideology over Christian values? That's the situation we are faced with, and, and we have to be realistic about it. So, as I say, it must be placed in context why Winston was detained and others who think similarly like him. Now, as a, a political detainee, in the early days, as I have been informed, Winston and others, they played chess and other games. It was a more relaxed atmosphere. But as the country became more tense, uh, they were restricted. And uh, at one time, our, a new section was built in the prison. So when I was detained in 1981, I was placed in a section with Winston and others. There was a landing and a landing like here and some to the left, some to the right. So you could turn around and talk to your neighbor who was next door to you, they had some bars. My closest neighbor was Teddy Victor. And I always remember him because every morning he wakes up with the song, Mary Immaculate Queen, Triumph and Reign. He was a committed Catholic and I always remember that. Winston was on the lower side of the landing but Winston and uh, Teddy and others, we read, I mean, extensively, lots of books. 
Khalil Gibran, Eric Fromm, Franz Fanon, Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah, I mean, philosophers and politicians and different authors we read extensively. And Winston was a great poet. We had uh, several visits, in particular by religious leaders. And I must say that one of the leaders who really inspired us was Father Oliver Levy. In as much as I, in my personal opinion, I believe that um, Jesus was disappointed with the Catholic authorities for not resisting the closure of the Catholic focus. You have to stand up for what is right, irrespective of the consequences, because they knew they didn't do anything wrong. So Levy was a man who inspired us well, and we are admiring for that. There was another lady, well, I guess those who are close to the Catholic Church might remember her. They call her Sister Ender. But she was a, a great defender of the revolution. And I remember after a discussion, Winston, in his poetic way, made a comment about the Witch of Ender. If you read the Bible, you may know what I'm talking about. But that was Winston. So we were restricted. We were given about one hour, sometimes to stay out in the landing, sometimes to go out and uh, re relax and, you know, stretch ourselves. But some of us exercise in ourselves. Like, I choose to get involved in yoga. Others may get involved in other things. But as I say, reading and discussion. We had lots of discussion with, in particular, as I say, the, those religious leaders. And they really realized that we were not guilty of anything. It was just a, a game being played. And that is why I'm saying that um, as I listen to the sisters and you see about the hypocrisy and this and that coming out, it is true. The society remained a, a hypocritical society during that period. And when you close, when a nation closes its eyes to the truth, you are destined for destruction. And we saw the destruction. So when I'm still, I want to come up and own up to the truth. But as I say, we must express our gratitude to Winston for his stand, for his contribution to our society, and uh, as a friend. He suffered, you know, uh, most of us suffered, but he suffered more than all of us, as far as I could recall. And there was no reason for that. If a man has been gifted, let us respect his, his gift. Let us discuss and debate. But we cannot suppress humanity for ideology. This is something we have to understand as a people. Nothing comes before the brotherhood of man. And we still don't want to uh, accept it. So again, my sincere condolences to the um, family of, of Winston White. And not only I wish that he rest in peace, but it is my hope that he would share in the resurrection. Thank you. I wonder if there's anyone in here who would have gone on to the Canadian farm labor. If there's one of you, then realize that the person who initiated that many years ago was Winston White. Might I take this opportunity now to ask another Winston, this time it's Winston Morgan, to please come forward. Winston Morgan, the son of Winston White. Good afternoon, all. Today, I want to take this opportunity to sing a song for our dad, the Lord's my shepherd. Mm. 
The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me. The quiet waters by my soul he not rest for again and me to walk doth make within the parts of righteousness in for his own name's sake. Yet though I walk through death's dark veil, yet will I fear no ill, for thou art with me on thy rod, and staff me comfort still. My table thou hast furnished in presence of my foes, my head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. For those of you who knew Winston well, you would know that that's the voice of Winston. Winston most definitely left that voice to him. Again, I take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you, members of the Foreign Diplomatic Corps. Welcome to the permanent secretaries and principals of different secondary schools. Welcome to MPs, of course, to the Minister for Finance. Good afternoon, sir, and welcome. MP Peter David, I spy you in the crowd. Welcome. It's important for us to understand and to realize that the path beaten by those who go before us should at all times be considered in our journey through life. I am not here to tell you that you should follow his footsteps, but I'm saying to you, there is no reason why you should not consider the path he took. It was very surprising to me not very long ago to understand, and I saw it, in the biography here, but in the conversation I had with him, and he was telling me about his studies in Guyana. And I'm like, W, what did you study in Guyana? And he said, journalism. And I gazed upon my feet. Why? Because I felt so embarrassed. I was involved in journalism for more than 25 years. And there standing before me, someone that I grew up knowing, I never knew that he majored in journalism in Guyana. A 
I take this opportunity now to ask a sister-in-law of Winston, Ms. Denise Joseph, and I'd like you to ask you to come forward. Now, no, I didn't know her very well, but um, since I said sister-in-law, I saw her start to ease up on the chair, so I knew exactly that was the lady I was talking about. Please come forward. If you need some help, I can give you. Winston charmed his way into Tessa's heart in the late 1960s when she worked with the Bank of Nova Scotia and then proceeded to charm his way into the hearts of the rest of her family. In our family, whose unions produced five handsome young men, his union with Tessa gave us two of the most beautiful girls, Zan and Naj, to love and spoil. He also introduced to our family his son Robert, whom we all love dearly and hold in very high esteem. Winston is famous for the nicknames, or should I say the pet names he had for people. In our family, Chad became Chadiboos, Clint, Clintibus, Quasi, Quas the Puis, Manny, Manifold, Dane, the Winks. And these were the names by which they were greeted whenever he met them. Winston could laugh at you when you were quite serious about something and end up making you laugh at yourself. One such experience I had with him was during a period when we all lived with my parents at their home, Rillwood, in 1983. My husband was working up the islands at the time for Shell Oil Com Company and only came to Grenada on some weekends. When he was due in one weekend, I sat on the veranda with Winston and very seriously asked him not to play with Dane too much this weekend because I said to him, Tony will be here and I feel Dane thinks you're his father. Well, Winston holding and playing with Dane at the time burst out into laughter saying, Winks, you hear what your mommy is saying? Limited interaction with you and I this weekend, my boy, and continued his laughter. I finally saw the humorous side of it and began laughing myself. Winston made use of all situations in which he found himself. During his four and a half years of captivity at the Richmond Hill Prison in the period of the revolution, my parents having sent my sister and their two girls to my sister B.A. and her family in the U.S. for a while, I visited him every week until Tessa came back, bringing him clean clothes and food stuff. Each time I came away with clothes to wash and wads of toilet paper with his very neat handwriting all over it, which I typed and kept for him. These were some of the copy pages for his book, Burning Embers, The Poems of a Prisoner. Winston is known far and wide for his excellent command of the English language and the perspicacity of his remarks during any conversation had you listening to every word whether or not you agreed with him. He gave a very short but beautiful and moving tribute to Tessa only six months ago at her funeral and now he has gone to join her. As he prayed for her then, I now pray that same prayer for him. Almighty, everlasting Father, my sovereign Lord and my God, we implore through your Holy Spirit the peace that passeth all understanding, 
the peace that would visit Winston and the rest of the family in these trying moments. Thank you kindly. Winston, throughout the years, we have loved you. We love you now, and we always will. You've gone from us physically, but we will cherish the memories you have left us. Rest in peace, my dear, dear brother. Amen. Thank you. Now the next person who's going to come forward here, I haven't seen that gentleman for many a year. I know that he would have worked at Winston back in the day, and it'll be a joy to see him today. Ladies and gentlemen, I call upon Mr. David Allard. Mr. Allard. Okay. Seems like Mr. Lard is now. So he wants to stay away from me, maybe. Let's move on. And uh, we now ask Miss Lillian Sylvester to come forward. Miss Sylvester? Good afternoon, church. I would like to recognize the presence of former Prime Minister, Honorable Tillman Thomas, former Prime Minister and, Minister and Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable Keith Mitchell. I see former Member of Parliament and Representative for St. Patrick's West, Mr. Lal Singh, Mr. Cornwall, the diplomatic corps and all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen who are here. When I received my autographed copy of the book Burning Embers, I noted that Mr. White wrote there, to my fellow northerner of whom I am proud and in whom I am very well pleased, I sincerely hope that you enjoy reading this. Regards. So sometime after that we met and he asked me what I thought of it and what was my favorite piece. And I said, black man. And he said, well, I don't really want to decide on a favorite, but I think my favorite is black man. So I said, okay, well, if that is so, if you pass before me, I'll read Black Man at your funeral. And if I pass before you, I would like you to do the same. And we smiled at that. So this afternoon, I'm here to read Black Man from the book Burning Embers. I must admit it's the first time I had to recite something over and over to get it right because I did not want to embarrass Brother Winston White. So here goes. Black man, where is your God whose forward brow looked over you, embroidering the tapestry of your dreams in the heat of trouble in Africa? Where is he whose quickening pulse was a drum in your ears, fighting the unconcern of the drugged sleep of ignorance? Is he no more whose mystic eyes cried into the valley of the Nile and unveiled the pyramids in the sands? Where is your God, black man? Your God is your history of faith in the eternity of the earth in your skin the spirit of your ancestors. Black man, 
Look at the bones of your children creaking towards the cemetery of broken promises and pained experiences. See the scorn of posterity, you fool, whose back is scarred with the luggage of the thief and the pirate, limping with the files of decadence. Yes, sir, yes, sir, your wretched mimic of Darwin's evolutionary stutter, the skeletal remains of a civilization proud. Black man, worshiper of the hidden, iconoclast and murderer, look inward and reach for your key. Not at him, you ass, but at yourself, your dreams, your culture. His ideologies have sucked the world like vampires approaching menopause and desecrated your heart, your temple, your nobility. Oh, black man, beware of the jargon of the lecher and of his acolytes among you. Open your eyes, but let him not see that you see the mirror of your glorious past and a glimpse of your scarlet future. You who peck at the wrenches and labored in his fields, who on your way down surrendered your crown for the glorious tomorrow in the great somewhere. Find your God. Black man, find your God. Find him again in Compassion Street and gaze at his mystic eyes, broad nose, and lips. There is your pride, your hope, your love. For faith in yourself is faith in your God, whose sad countenance is lined with the sorrow of yesteryear. Thank you. As I gaze upon the program here, I see another name of a gentleman whom I can consider to be a friend, but I haven't seen that friend for a very, very, very long time. I speak of none other than playwright, artistic director, and founder of Heritage, Mr. Christopher Driggs, Mr. Driggs. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I bring expressions of deepest sympathy from Heritage Theatre Company. As some of you may know, Robert is the president of our theatre company. And uh, Brother Winston White became something of an ex officio member of Heritage attending many of our rehearsals and sitting through with an appreciative and sometimes critical eye. I also bring you expressions of sympathy from the Grenada Cultural Foundation. The poem I'm about to deliver is entitled, A Man Comfortable in His Skin. He was a man comfortable in his skin and wise to the world. At home in the company of princes, at home in the company of paupers, an ambassador to all humanity. He was a friend and counselor to people, people in high places and people in low places. A soul blessed with patience, empathy, and boundless generosity. An orator endowed with the gift of the garb. Possessing an eloquence worthy of statesmen and philosophers, but smooth enough to sell snow cone to the Eskimos. A mind so nimble and perceptive, and a tongue laced with 
a satirical edge, a cunning glint in his eyes, betraying an awareness, his awareness that we are all carrying our own hidden narratives, communicating his message of solidarity to all. I have been there. I have done that. I see you, my brother. He was patrician and patriot. His sense of being anchored in a profound knowledge of self, unfazed by newfangled ideas and the glitter of things trending. He walked with confidence, the confidence of a man The confidence of a man assured of the permanence of his worldview. He was, after all, a man for all seasons, not lingering to agonize about perils lurking behind the corners of his life, not risk, not averse to risk in business or in pleasure. He acted on his hunches and he rolled with the punches. He knew life was not a sprint but a marathon run, so he took his time to gather the notches on his gun. Yes, he was a man who lived and had his fun. He was an institution, homegrown and resilient as the walls of this Catholic Church. He was undefeated by misfortune, ill health, even incarceration. His appetite for brango and fish broth, good in every situation. He was known by all, even little children knew his name. Throughout the ends of Grenada, Old Winston had his fame. He was a player and witness at big moments in our history. He had a special sense of occasion, all part of this man's mystery. He had seen worlds change and empires rise and was still standing tall in the times of demise. And for all the intellectual heights he was able to reach, he never presumed he had any special rights to preach. Nor was he weighed down by grudges, he knew how to forgive for he understood life, and life was short-lived. So he left his footprints, footprints etched out in the sands of time, and our human landscape will be poorer for his departure. He has left a legacy, not of a superhero flying off gloriously into the sunset, but as a man flawed and sanctified by his better angels. We will hear his hearty laughter in the winds, Winds washing over the sacred grounds where his mortal remains will rest. We will sense his presence in bars and street corners, street corners with street lawyers, discussing matters of state, religion, and folklore, and maybe some real estate. We will feel his great aura as we watch Robert stride, or in the manner of his other offsprings serving our nation with pride. So by Patrician, our brother Winston White, we'll see you when we get there. Au revoir and good night. Thank you very much, Brother Deriggs. We move now down to the Grand Dance area and invite Brother Paul McIntyre to come forward. Another friend I haven't seen for a long time. He used to be a basketballer. I don't know what happened. A pleasant, a pleasant good afternoon to all. Today I stand proud on this platform to speak about a friend, a boss, a brother, a brother who has been great to the Grand Dance community. Winston, whom I know well, I remember many great things of him. One, a poem he wrote and I just want to give you the beginning of the poem. And I hope that all of us in this room, in this church, listen to this carefully. 
it touched me deeply and I'm sure it will do the same for you. The poem words simply, launder your thoughts as you would your garments. And I asked Winston what that meant. I was pretty young. And he said, Pabs, as Tessa uh, rightly said, he had a name for everybody, a nickname. He said, Pabs, it simply means clean your thoughts as you would clean your clothes. And Winston, this took with me and is still with me and would stay with me for life. I also want to speak about the contribution Winston made as a parliamentarian. There are four sporting facilities in Grenada that Winston was part of the team that negotiated from the Venezuelan government. The Grove Basketball Court, the Carnage Basketball Court, Woburn Pavilion, and the newly refurbished Grand Dance Sporting Complex. These four units is 50 years old, and they were all organized and prepared under the leadership of my great friend, Winston. Winston also taught us, myself and Robert, of how to be humble, listen to your leaders, and learn the best from them. I want to thank, publicly thank Winston for his contribution in making who, making me who I am. I also want to speak on Winston's influence in golf course, 007 Bar, Bush Bar, Mervyn Shop, and Clovis Bar in Grand Dance. Winston contributed great knowledge to all of us in those areas. I want to thank everyone, and I just want to once again say, Winston, thank you for the contribution you've made to us. May your soul rest in peace. God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McIntyre. Coming next to pay tribute and to salute a friend is none other than Rupert Bay Greenwich. Okay, I've just been informed that it will be done virtually. Right. Can we have it, please? go get water, you know. I, I have a story, right? You know, when we first died, when 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 we first died, I saw Winston at Kopi's on the beach, you know. Winston always comes there and take up. So he sees me say, hey Dr. Bay, how you doing? I say, I'm good doc, you know. And you know Winston is, is smooth. So he, he he said, well you're making one? And I said, of course I'm making a drink. Or well, anything for you, I'll do anything for you. So Winston orders everyone 
are wrong. Kopi, you're gonna have one. Leo, you're gonna have one. Rest his soul. Everyone, about 15 people. So I was like, ooh, man, Doc is fetting everybody today. You know, Palos is fetting everybody. When he turns around, he said, Dr. Bay. He opens his wallet. He said, Dr. Bay, I have nothing in there. That is on you now. <laughs> it was such a funny and amazing thing because for me, doing this for Winston, it was a pleasure. Because that man will do anything for anyone. He will leave what he's doing if he sees you and he said you want to arrive, he will take you all the way up to St. Paul's. An amazing man. Doctor, he gave me the name Dr. Bay. Winston, I'm going to miss you. You have done an amazing job. You have played your part. Your time has come to be with the Creator. It's tough. You know? Because, man. Wow, what an amazing person, what an amazing man. Give you the shirt off his back. Zandra, Najwa, and the rest of the family, except my sympathy. You guys got a lot to live up to, a lot to live up to for this man. Winston White, AKA Palos, Dr. Bay is gonna miss you. I love you, I love you, you know? Wish I was there for this funeral, but we'll see in the next life. You are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. The amen still exists, right? Thank you. Now we go to the lineage once again, and we ask Dwight McLeish, the grandson of Winston, to come and pay his tribute to his grandfather, and he'll be doing so at this time. Dwight McLeish. One, two. Afternoon to everyone.
shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be you raise me up so I can stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas and I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. gentlemen, let's take a moment and recognize in our presence the Honorable Prime Minister of Grenada, the Honorable Deacon Mitchell. Sir, good afternoon and welcome. I have just been, okay, I've been told stand down. So in a moment, I'll do just that. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to stand as we recognize in our midst the Governor General of Grenada, Dame Cecile Lagrenade.
heads, our Commissioner of Police, Mr. Don McKenzie, and I, rec I, I, I recognize him and in a very special way to say, welcome to St. Patrick, sir. <laughs> to do the next tribute, it's going to be one with music as we ask Don Forsyth, son-in-law, to come forward and pay his respects with music. Don. Um, before I do a little light song, hopefully that reflects the spirit of my father-in-law. Good afternoon, church. I wouldn't like to just start by playing without saying something about my father-in-law as probably the only son-in-law who will say something here today. I, um, I remember when I just started dating Zandra, you know, of course, Winston White's, the legendary Winston White's reputation preceded him before I started seeing Zandra. So, Needless to say, I was very nervous about meeting him, and I remember sitting, you heard Auntie Denise talk about Rillwood, the family house on golf course. I was sitting in the veranda, chatting with Zandra, and then it was the day I was supposed to meet him, and I look back now and I'm wondering what, I was, what was I so nervous about, but I was. And then as he stepped out of the car, he started walking towards the veranda, and I heard him say, Zan Zan, that's how he referred to Zan, Zan Zan. Your father just had a wonderful crayfish waters. Oh gosh, nigger right is straight, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> so I had a good chuckle. And now as I reflect on it a few years later, quite a few years later, quite a few grays later, I, um, I realized that was just his way of just saying, young man, chill, <laughs> you know, relax yourself, you're good. And then one more story before I go. I am, um, and quite a few stories, right? Not all are fit to tell in the church. <laughs> But, um, but quite a few stories. And, um, but this one, it was my birthday. And by that time, a couple of years in the relationship, we weren't married yet. But, um, and then Zan said to him, Dad, today is Dawn's birthday, you know. And he came and said, Brother Dawn. And mind you, by this time, I don't know how to refer to him. I don't know how to call him Dad. I don't know if to call him Mr. White. I, I kind of stuck with Brother White in the end. But he said, Brother Dawn, today's your birthday. We need to drink a rivers, man. I say, Brother White, I ain't lying to tell you. <laughs> I ain't know if me and the rivers could make it. He said, Ho, ho, ho. Well, you're not a real man. I started drinking rivers the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, could the sound engineer please help me out here?
done, you could quit your day job. You're good. You could quit the day job. You're good. Wonderful renditions there. We now invite the senior management board to come forward. I think they're being represented by permanent secretary and patrician, Mr. Finley Jeffrey. Please, sir. Good afternoon, church. On behalf of the cabinet secretary and the rest of permanent secretaries, I want to extend sincere condolences to our sister permanent secretary, Roxy Hutchinson, and to all of the White Clan, Sarana, Robert, show me our sincere condolences. This is a man who, first of all, I thank because many years ago he fathered a daughter that I adopted, not with papers, but with love. Sarana, and according to the saying, even though she turned woman now, but she still calls me daddy, and I still think of her as my little girl. So that's one. Two, I admired his vocabulary, very much so. I remember when I found myself in the deep end, one time when I happened to sing a calypso about Pan and who didn't like Pan. And my name was beaten all about, and he met me and he said to me, and he, he said that to somebody else. Somebody told me, he told them that. He said, Scholar, I hear your name in dispatches. He said, But don't bother. I hear in mine too. And I don't bother. Him, so you don't bother. And thirdly, I learned a valuable lesson from him in how to make light of a difficult situation. There was one time, must tell you that, um, it was just around when COVID was going out, and I came up to the teller in Sutter's, thinking that the lines would be short, but the lines were very long. So I realized straight out, I should have stayed in Grenville and make a mistake. But I joined the line, and I realized five minutes at the back, 10 minutes, the line ain't going nowhere, and people, stretching the neck and they're cursing and they're getting on. So I wondered well, what's going on inside it. So I went up, looked inside the boot, and there was Winston inside there. And he stepped back, squint, he juke about me, stepped back again. <laughs> Watch it, he squint, he juke about me again, and then the card came out. Take the card, he wipe it on his shirt, he blew it, push it back in. And the lady close to the door, she said to me, that's about 10 times that happening. <laughs> Eventually, he got his thing done. But I went in and I said to him, I said, so win this man. You see people vex outside it. And he said to me, scholar, I believe God sent me here this morning to teach these people how to have patience. <laughs> that was the man he was. Now, the SMB has asked me to pay tribute to him with a poem, but I know my place. I am not no reciter of poem. A man must know what his strengths are. I'm a singer. And so I will sing a verse, especially dedicated, especially to my daughter, Sarana. It is an excerpt from one of my long ago calypsos voices. A voice echoes in a distant and sacred part of my soul. 
a vibration that is so haunting telling tales that never gets told filled with metaphoric excellence it was a voice that transcended time as the voice called again i recognize this dear old mentor of mine mm -hmm. I feel the Almighty needed someone to explaciate for the heavenly host. And of all the mortals among us, Brother Winston was his choice, of course. So even though his journey is over and his life's work on earth is done, he has gone to fulfill a destiny. A new journey has begun. Voices, I keep hearing all those. All you could sing with me. Voices crying out of the wilderness. Yes, voices, I keep hearing all those. Ah, wishing his soul would find. Peaceful rest, sorry. But if you listen very closely at night, you're sure to hear in the wind a poet reciting some sweet poetry that makes your blood crawl within. And no care how you look, you see no one there. Be not afraid of distress. It's just your old papa somewhere up there. He's doing what he does best. But well, that is of a bigger amen than that. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, we now invite to the podium Leader of His Majesty's Opposition, Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Mitchell. You know, I never thought Scholar had uh, any other Caleb so but one and Keith Mitchell, so I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. To be here. I, I, I used to tell him, when I'm done with this thing, I don't know what you're going to sing. <laughs> of course, let me recognize, of course, our Governor General, Dean Cecil Agunagan, and the Honorable Prime Minister, Dean Mitchell, and of course, the family members, because that's your day, not our day. And of course, all distinguished brothers and sisters who are present here today, and I'm sure the thousands online listening to the departure of Brother Winston for the rest of this little tribute. I'll be calling him W. He used to call me W. He used to call me Doc, and I call him W. But you know, in compiling this little tribute, I wasn't sure the chronological aspects of this tribute, um, whether I met Winston first through politics or whether through cricket. But I recognize when I start playing things over and listening I realized that it was said that Winston was a, a very good cricketer and he played for GBSS. But those of you, I could not recall him then. I heard he was a good bowler and batsman, but I didn't remember nothing. So, but you see, those days, the school cricket was dominated by the Presentation College. So while we played GBS, I was, we would not have recognized the efforts and the talent of those boys from the, the Grenada Boys Secondary School. In fact, colleagues, you just to know, the only time a school won the Grenada National Championship, beating every other team in the country, including those in the countryside, was in 1964. And it was the Brother Dickon 
the presentation brothers college but friends in 1972 i was on the political platform at one party as the youngest candidate in that general elections and Winston was on the other one as the youngest candidate in that general election. As you know, I didn't win, of course not. But Winston came close by one vote. He lost by one vote. And I remember the GLP people were mad. They say, you might have been in a rum shop when you should have been campaigning and get that one extra vote. <laughs> but you know, W always find fun with everything that he does. But he was named in the cabinet then as the Minister of Sports. He was the youngest Minister of Sports in Grenada at the time, history of Grenada, and of course, the, I believe also the Caribbean. And Stan was very, as you know, a flashy dress down to everything had to be special. And of course, Winston, as the youngest minister of, of the government then, he had a, what you call him, nice little car with convertible. I tried to find out the name of those cars then, but no one could give me a name. But it's just a convertible. And I remember I used to be driving that from Sotez to St. George's and passing Happy Hill. And I used to say, Lord, I wish I was this man in truth. He looked pretty. <laughs> and driving this car, open me and everybody, Winston, Winston, WW, and so on. But you know, I said, he dressed nice, he was a brilliant orator, so he spoke well. Couldn't have, very few people could have done it better than Winston, who was articulated today. He also drove us one of the nicest cars in the country. And of course, as I said, he was very flashy, well-dressed. But those of you who know Uncle Geary well, if you are in his team, you can't dress nicer than him. <laughs> you can't speak, appear to be more articulate than him. And you can't afford to have a nicer car than him. So Winston had a number of strikes against him. And he was a ladies' man, and Uncle Believe is a better ladies' man. <laughs> so I, say, I said to myself, he ain't go last. <laughs> because one day, Winston said to me, the man said to him, Winston, you look like you want my job. <laughs> <laughs> but friends, if you know uncle, you better dress less smart than him. But you know, later on, we heard, we, I joined the Atoms Cricket Club, St. George's, Winston joined GCC, and they had a match of two top teams at the time, two of the top teams. And I heard of Winston was this great fast bowler and so on. So I, I went into bat number five and I see this man take a run from here to all down there. So I say, by the time he reached the wicket, he must be tired. So, and somebody said, I think somebody said, he bonked somebody. So he bonks and of course, the ball was slow, so I just walked back in the boundary. He bounced a second time, 
I say, man, you're too slow. You're taking too much run. Take a shorter run. You're going to do better. And Winston's face is as bad as ever. That's one. But let me tell you something. At the end of the match, and that is Winston. You know, he's the first person I call me. He say, hey, Keith. The door says, Keith. I recognize you. And I recognize it's the first time I was able to be dispatched. It, while I thought of being a good bouncer. But that was Winston. He always recognized and accepted when someone else did better than him. He was not the type of person who kept believing one thing all the time. But as an orator, he was said, I don't think anyone could fault the fact to say that that one of the best orator this country has ever seen. That's a fact. Winston was in debating GBSS. And as you said already, whether it's sports, no matter what it is, football, cricket, the competition was GBSS and Presentation College. And in Presentation College, we had Morris Bishop. So you had two of the finest debaters. So, you know, when the beat came, the halls are parked. And you know something? The convent girls have to be on our side. And the high school girls have to be on GBSS side. And don't cross the boundaries because you'll be accused of being a traitor. But this was some of the best debates you could have ever seen, because everyone knows Morris as a brilliant speaker, and knowing Winston as a brilliant speaker also. So the competition was stiff. Sometimes college won, sometimes GBSS won. But that was the legacy that this um, Winston and Morris had over the years. So it wasn't surprising that Winston got involved with the Alliance in 1976. And of course, one of the things we all must recognize about Winston, Winston is a serious Democrat. You cannot fault him that if you are not understanding the principles of democracy, Winston will stand up. So he joined the Alliance to fight Gary in 1976. And of course, they won, Gary won nine seats, the Alliance won six. So Hubbard Blaze was leader of the, new, of the GNP, and Winston was leader of his CDLP, and the NJM was led by Morris Bishop. And that was a combination of a team that, won, that fought the Alliance. So Blaze expected Winston to support him to be leader of the opposition. Winston supported Morris Bishop. <laughs> Mr. Blaze never forgot that, because he told me the story. But Winston saw that Morris would do a better job, and therefore he felt obliged to support him. Now, it was well known that in 1983, that the New National Party was formed, and those of us who remember that the three parties, CDLP, GDM, NDC, and GNP, went to Union Island. Let me say, I wasn't there. Just say, I'll say I wasn't there, but I was picked by when they decided that they, they were going to form this alliance to fight the GLP in 1983, and Tillman got a pick too. Both of us got picked after. <laughs> but you know, Winston saw me afterwards and he said, he pulled out of the, the, the formation and said he could not support it. He did not think it was the right process and right approach to formation of a united front. And he stayed in opposition. The point I'm making is, 
If he doesn't feel something is right, it doesn't matter who, he will stand up and be counted accordingly. So it was not surprising that when the revolution came, and of course, Morris New Winston was a brilliant orator and respected him, and Morris knew that Winston will not stop speaking his mind. So as was pointed out by Tillman a while ago, he paid the price for his conviction and his stance because there's no way, if you know Winston well, you know where you could accuse him of plotting to overthrow any institution. That simply is not in his DNA. But that was sold, and of course he joined, he was in that Richmond Hill prison for all the years. Friends, and you know, significantly Winston came out of prison and anybody could tell you there was not a hateful blood in this man. I couldn't understand it after spending four years of your liberty having been taken away from you and you could come and smile and move with persons who did you that wrong. It demonstrates the level of the personality and the character of Winston White. My friends, I think it's important for us to recognize this also. After the 1990 gen general elections when the new National Party lost badly, Winston joined the new National Party in opposition. But you know Winston is a very ambitious guy. Tillman started to laugh because he knows what I'm coming with. Winston, after some months, decided he should be leader of the new National Party. <laughs> so Winston joined a team called the A-Team to decide to remove me as political leader. And so when the convention was called, the A-Team was soundly beaten by the B team, which was then led by myself. You know something, friends? Winston, after that event, some of the members of that A team literally hardly spoke to me afterwards. But Winston was the first person to call and congratulate me and to say that he will continue to work for the country and continue to work for democracy. The point is, he knew that he lost, accepted it, but there was just simply no bitterness. So if it's one thing that all of us could learn from Winston, never allow politics or religion or anything to get in the way that make us so bitter that we won't even talk to each other. I've seen it happened over and over in the political arena. The relationship and with one another is far more important than the politics, the political association, the religious association, and so on. So in my view, friends, W, I'm sure, would tell those, anyone who is trying to move me as leader would know that W will tell them, don't try it. <laughs> Right, W? My friends? <laughs> Finally, friends, let me say this. Winston lived a life, a full life. Politics, sports, business with Zublin, and he was a community activist, activist. So he has lived a full life. So I agree when it was said that Winston, we are celebrating, we are not mourning his departure, celebrating and to his family, his children, and all of you. You should feel proud that your dad has contributed in his life. He may have had it tough, and in his last days, I don't think we, we took care of him sufficiently. I think that's a stain on all of us. The Winston had some tough times, from what I understand, in his final days. 
but he has lived a full life and we should appreciate the life they have lived and the service and the love and appreciation he has given all of us. Thank you. May he rest in peace. <clears throat> Very much, Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable Dr. Keith Mitchell. Ladies and gentlemen, we now invite Prime Minister of Grenada, the Honorable Deacon Mitchell, to pay his respects. Governor General Dame Cecile Lagrenade, to the family members of Winston White, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the government and people of Grenada, and on my own behalf, I extend deepest condolences to the family of Winston White. We are all gathered here this afternoon in a show of support to his family, his friends, and his wider community who are no doubt grieving his passing. But we are also here, as has been said prior to my arrival and has been said by the leader of His Majesty's opposition, to pay tribute to and to celebrate his life with you his family, his friends, and the members of the wider community. A life, by all accounts, that was well and fully lived. A life lived with tallness in tribute to his physical stature and with zest, panache, and style in keeping with his smooth smile and his classic, if not aristocratic, and immediately recognizable voice and oratory. To his family and his friends and his community, saying goodbye is no doubt a difficult event. But I think you can all share in the immense pride of the life that he lived and the life that he shared with you and the community of Grenada. His passion was evident in his love for sports, youth development, poetry, the arts, his community, his politics, his country, and above all, his family. So from an early age, he devoted his life to serving Grenada, first as a distinguished leader when called upon by Sir Eric Matthew Geary. His public service was in an era when Grenada underwent significant and dramatic socio-economic and political change. But even after he was no longer involved in active or frontline politics, he devoted himself to the socio-economic development of Grenada and played a major role in business and in advocacy on public matters of importance. So to all of us, he's an example in small and large ways that we can all follow whether it is his seemingly almost endless smiling and jovial nature, his willingness to always make time for conversation with anyone, his zest for life and enjoying living, or the diverse areas that he took part in. We can all honor his legacy by sampling from his life and by continuing to build a better Grenada for future generations. 
I don't recall the first time that I actually interacted with Mr. White. But as his son-in-law Don said, a lot of the times the very jovial comments that he made to me were not meant for polite society or for a church. But there was one thing that always struck me about him. He seemingly always saw the funny side of life. He had a wicked sense of humor, and he was never afraid to share his thoughts with you. It did not matter whether you were considerably younger than him. It did not matter whether you were considerably less experienced than him. He was always willing to share life lessons with those who had a willing ear. Those who have spoken before me have spoken about his contributions to Grenada, and I need not repeat them. But no doubt, his commitment to community and his vision and life that was well lived enriched the lives of many, leaving a permanent and positive mark on the nation and the community which he so enthusiastically served. So may his passion, his jovial nature, his classic oratory inspire future generations of Grenada. And may his family take comfort in knowing that his was a life well lived and that he did it his way. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. We have now come to the part of this function which sort of pulls the curtain down on the tributes, and that is going to be the eulogy which will be done by Robert and his siblings. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert White and his siblings to do the eulogy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to invite my siblings to join me here on the podium. As you can see, we all in some ways would represent or indicate the strength of our father's genes. We're all good looking. <laughs> Please allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to offer warm fraternal greetings to you as you join myself and my siblings here with me, as well as other relatives, friends from within as well as from outside of St. Patrick, to celebrate what I choose to refer as the passing out parade for this legendary figure, Michael Winston White, who was more popularly known as Winston. When I was selected to do this eulogy, I quickly realized what an awesome responsibility it was. There is so much to be said about this man called Winston. And I wondered, how could I do justice to his memory without boring you with a lengthy discourse? The truth is, we could easily spend the rest of the year here. But I promise you, I won't be longer than 10 minutes. Is that OK? Is that OK? Thank you. Now, on Thursday, July 20th, 1944, well over 79 years ago, Iris White and Kitchener Noel was gifted with a son, Michael Winston White. Now, throughout his early years at the St. Patrick Roman Catholic Church, right here, 
his brilliance, eloquence, his duties as an acolyte, and of course his mother, his grandmother, sorry, being the cook at the school, ensure that he stood out from the crowd. Now Winston grew up with his grandmother, Matit, or, well, Agatha Tate, also called Matit, who considered him her last child. She loved him to the moon and wasted no time in castigating anyone who dared to even think of having an opinion that differed to that of her grandson. In her eyes, Winston had a monopoly on thoughts, words, and deeds. Now combine that with a voracious appetite for reading, and the exciting result was a young man whose self-confidence, brilliance, and oratory skills catapulted him into stardom in the village, and that is in Back Street or Glebe Street. To summarize the response of the village folk, that child was bright. Now my sister Nicole writes, and I quote, at the very early age, he won the Island Scholarship Award and entered the GBSS. In fact, he led the GBSS debating team during his tenure and boasts about having un been unbeaten and unrivaled. That is his boast. I heard Dr. Mitchell say something different a while ago. I say what my father tell me. Right? So he, he, during his tenure, he boasts about being unbeaten and unrivaled despite the presence of another of Grenada's best known orator, Maurice Bishop, on the opposing team, the PBC. And I unquote. Now, more about Maurice later. Now, after graduating from the GBSS, he was granted the opportunity to continue his studies in Guyana, majoring in journalism. Winston's vision and love for Grenada was evident throughout his life, and he firmly believed that regardless of what system of government ruled Grenada, an opposing voice was necessary to balance his scales of justice. His commitment to that ideal was such that though he was out of Grenada when the revolution occurred, and he was warned that while visiting his dear friend, Reynold Benjamin, in Trinidad, that he should not return to Grenada. He will, be re he will be arrested and imprisoned. He was resolute in the decision to come home, nonetheless. He said, that, he said then that he had done nothing wrong, and he had his family here, so he was coming home and would face any consequence. At this point, let's revisit the rivalry between the leaders of the GBSS and the PBC debating team, etc., etc. Now that rivalry, the genesis of which was started at the secondary school level, persisted into adult life via both the romance with politics as well as the politics of romance. And resulted in four and a half years long imprisonment labeled as a counter-revolutionary under the Maurice Bishop-led People's Revolutionary Government. Now, those very familiar with Winston's life will fully understand my reference to the politics of romance. But I will resist the urge to elaborate since it will push me to make revelations that should be better left alone. Winston always jokingly contended that this was the only way Maurice Bishop could have beaten him, by locking him away in prison. But even so, his indomitable spirit or character never allowed him to be broken. In fact, he posited that distractions, that one who is in prison, sorry, and therefore not bombarded by the noise and the distractions of life on the outside, has a unique opportunity to go inside, into the recesses of the inner man and connect with the spirit. Now this, he says, opened a whole new vista and he journeyed to exciting realms where the physical being could never take him. 
He understood life and determined that one of the most powerful and necessary attributes of mankind it's not just the ability to forgive, but the willingness to forgive. Forgiveness, he said, releases you from the self-imposed bondage that accompanies hate and allows you to soar. For hate, said he, may never affect the hated, but certainly destroys the hater. And I remember him writing from the prison to tell me that. The letter was, the salutation was, my son, my son, I'll never forget that. And as a testament to his spiritual awakening in prison, and notice I said spiritual, not necessarily religious. He was quick to forgive those responsible for his imprisonment. Forgive those who tortured him in prison. And I guess he prayed, forgive them, Father, even if they know what they're doing. Winston's masterful oratory and debating skills did not go unnoticed. In fact, it caught the interest of the leader of the Grenada United Labour Party, the GOLP, and so he was wooed into politics via the senatorial appointment at the age of 25, making him the youngest minister of government in the entire Commonwealth at that time. This record was only recently broken by yet another Grenadian, Honorable Kareen James, current Minister for Climate, Resilience, Environment, and Renewable Energy. And she assumed this at age 24. As the first ever Minister of Youth Affairs, he was assigned to the Ministry of Labor, Youth Development, and Sport, and was the one responsible for initiating the Farm Labor Program, where Grenadians got the opportunity to travel annually to Canada to pick fruits, thereby creating an avenue for income generation. I have a copy of a letter written to the Canadian High Commissioner in Bridgetown on October 23, 1973. It is a treasured keepsake. To the High Commissioner, he wrote, and I quote, we are experiencing in Grenada a rather unpleasant employment sorry, situation. I would be grateful if our Commonwealth sister could assist. The particular sphere at which we are aiming is the fruit industry, which we are reliably informed are always in the need of workers. We have just been given the subject of labor in our ministry with a view to arresting the aforementioned trend, unquote. This program is still in existence today. A testament of a visionary minister who was then only 29 years. Thank you. Now, despite his success as a young minister, there were many who saw him as a, f who saw in him, sorry, a future in law. And his story is told that while on a Commonwealth engagement, the then Prime Minister of Australia took a liking to him and convinced him of the wisdom of a change in vocation to law. And so armed with that endorsement, Winston approached Sir Eric, and Sir Eric hit the roof. Winston, he said, what foolishness are you telling me? I am giving you an opportunity to make law. You telling me you want to study law? <laughs> well, that promptly ended all pursuits in that direction. But he kept his lawyer friends, people like Reynold Benjamin, his childhood friend. They went back as far as acolyte days in this very church. The Honorable Tillman Thomas, who you heard a while ago, they shared four years in the mahogany row. Yes, he told you that too under the PRG, and other lawyers like Carl Hudson Phillip, 
now deceased, a Trinidadian legal luminary who was instrumental in providing legal work for Zublin during the conceptualization and execution phases of the cruise sport, one of Winston's hallmark achievements. Now that project was designed to undergo a second phase which involved reclamation of a further 22 acres. I'm subject to correction with regard to the acreage here. There was some 20 something I think though. So 22 acres of land, this time extending all the way out from the National Stadium area up to Grand Mall. But this phase involved the opening of a casino. And the Prime Minister of the day, his good old cellmate, Tillman Thomas said, second phase, yes, casino, no. And Zublin responded, no casino, no second phase. And as he said in chess, checkmate. But friends do always agree with you, and that's all right. Friends remain friends. And so Honorable Tillman Thomas is still here today to show his last respects. Both himself and Dr. Keith mentioned that Winston held no grudges. Right? It is what it is. One of his most treasured accomplishments, though, was being a representative on the government side of the delegation that traveled to England to negotiate the attainment of Grenada's independence from Britain. On February 7, 2024, while looking at the parade from our home, he lamented, my son, I'm glad to be alive to witness how far we've come in 50 years. It would have been good to sit in the park with the officials if only they remembered me. I hope he didn't take that to his grave because, as I said, he don't hold grudges. It is one of the very few occasions that I witness him attempt to throw the spotlight on himself. The world-renowned modern university domiciled here in Grenada contributes over 20% to GDP, Grenada's GDP. When the idea was floated by then Prime Minister Eric Gehry, it was castigated in some quarters and even by some politicians as a pie in the sky. Now I'm borrowing from today's political jargon. That's not what they said then, but that's what they meant. Over four decades later, it is heralded as one of the best things to have happened to Grenada with respect to our economic development. Now, my father always told the story that there was a regional strike by Liat's pilots at that time, and he was trapped in Antigua. He was needed in Grenada to cast his vote for the granting of a license to the university to operate. He coaxed his cousin, then Michael Blackburn, who was a pilot with Liat at the time, but more than that, he was president of the Pilots Association, so he was the one leading the strike. But my father said he needed to get back to Grenada to ensure that the project got the green light. And just like that, strike ended. He was heralded as a hero. Family, Michael understood, meant everything. All right? So Winston was able to quell the strike. Now, he enjoyed sports in general, but loved the game of cricket. You heard that earlier on. And while in school in St. George's, he was heralded as a fast bowler from St. Patrick. Somebody just say, Yen wasn't that fast. <laughs> yeah. Well, in a recent conversation with the same person, and that is prime, former Prime Minister Keith Mitchell, who remains an avid cricketer himself, he told me, as he told you, that he had many opportunities to play against Winston and he considered him not too fast a bowler at all. <laughs> In fact, he said Winston couldn't get him out. Now, I didn't see nothing agreeing with him, but I felt very hurt. <laughs> because I think it is not good practice to ill speak the dead. <laughs> so, on my, the behalf of my father's name and legacy, I am offering Dr. Mitchell a chance to face me in four. <laughs> on any Sunday, in front of any crowd, under one condition, a bowling him with young breadfruit. 
Good old original country style cricket ball. Winston was a socialite and thrived on friendly engagement. I'm certain he knew 99% of all the rum shops on the island and knew where all his friends lived as he visited in search of friendly debates. He thrived on debates and as he was conversant on a wide range of topics, he was almost always victorious. But more than that, he loved the communal spirit that existed as there was always food and drinks. It was as if life was a perpetual celebration with the only changes being the venues and the company. So in one day, he would, could be seen in Grand Dance, then Sotez, then Guav, and then back to Grand Dance. It was his life. The lifestyle that created opportunities for other engagements as evidenced by the representation here on the platform. There are 12 of us. The other persons who claim to have intimate knowledge put the figure much higher. And now to the moralists in the audience whose minds started racing with the speed of a Formula One car driven by Sir Lewis Hamilton. Winston would opine that he was dutifully paying attention to the divine injunction, go ye into the world, be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> and might I add, we are indeed happy, all of us extremely happy, to call Michael Winston White, with all his millions of faults, because he had some too, our father, and we wish him God's speed. And so today, the White family from Sotez, Trinidad, Chantemel, the Springle family, other families, the Baptiste family, and there are so many other families that are intertwined and connected to this tributary, Winston White. We say we are extremely happy that you are here with us today as we offer our last respects. Now, when I, a while ago, knew that my time was coming, and specifically when Scholar came up here and did this rendition, and interfered with me. I didn't know that I would actually make it through this. But I'm happy I did, and I thank the energy from my siblings behind me. I love you all. Maurice Bishop was an orator. Winston White was also. Robert White is definitely one who is still with us. Thank you, Robert. Well, we have come to the part where I take my departure. Again, on behalf of the family, I thank each and every one of you for being here this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, goodbye, God bless, and take care. I love you.
in, in the name of the Father and of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I bless the body of Michael Winston White with holy water that recalls his baptism of his St. Paul rites. All of us were baptized into Jesus, were baptized into his death. By baptism into his death, you were buried together with him. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him by likeness to his death, so shall we be united with him by likeness to his resurrection. On the day of his baptism, Winston put on Christ. In the day of Christ's coming, may he be clothed with glory. Let us all sing the entrance hymn. in Christ, I would like to acknowledge the presence 
of the Governor General, Dame Cecile Lagrenade, Honorable Deacon Michel, the Prime Minister, members of Cabinet, Senator the Honorable Dr. Decima Williams, the President of the Senate, Honorable Leo Keto, Speaker of the House of the Rep the House of Representatives, Dr. the Right Honorable Keith Mitchell, Leader of His Majesty's Opposition, Mr. Tillman Thomas, former Prime Minister, family of the late Mr. Winston White, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Ms. Cavill, let Cabinet Secretary and other members of the Senior Managers Board, the current and the former parliamentarians, relatives, friends, and well wishes, you are all welcome to this funeral rite. Beloved in Christ, we are not going to be here forever. We are strong today, but we are not sure of tomorrow. Today, we have to say goodbye to Mr. White. He has been taken away from us to the grave beyond. Everything has its own season and time. The time has come for Mr. White to depart from this world. But there is hope for a better life in heaven. As believers, we know that we will not remain in the grave forever. With this hope, let us comfort one another. On behalf of this church, I extend my sincerest condolences to the family members, the loved ones, and the sympathizers. Take heart and be strong. God will take care of you. God will be with you. One day, we shall see Winston and enjoy his friendship. Let us pray. O God, to whom mercy and forgiveness belong, hear our prayers on behalf of your servant, Michael Winston White, whom you have called out of this world, and because he put his hope and trust in you, command that he be carried safely home to heaven and come to enjoy your eternal reward. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Be seated, please. First reading a reading from the letter of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 to 13 there is a season for everything a time for every occupation on the heaven a time for giving birth a time for dying a time for planting, a time for uprooting what has been planted. A time for killing, a time for healing. A time for knocking down, a time for building. 
a time for tears, a time for laughter, a time for mourning, a time for dancing, a time for throwing stones away, and a time for gathering them, a time for embracing, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time for searching, a time for losing, a time for keeping, a time for discarding, a time for tearing, a time for sowing, a time for keeping silent, and a time for speaking, a time for loving, a time for hating, a time for war, a time for peace. What do people gain from the efforts they make? I contemplate the task that God gives humanity to labor at. All that he does is apt for its time. But although he has given us an awareness of the passage of time, we can grasp neither the beginning nor the end of what God does. I know there is no happiness for human being except in pleasure and enjoyment through life. And when we eat and drink and find happiness in all our achievements, this is a gift from God. I know that whatever God does will be forever. The word of the Lord.
God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him has eternal life. with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Mary the sister of Lazarus went to Jesus and as soon as she saw him she threw herself at his feet saying Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died. At the sight of her tears and those of the Jews who followed her, Jesus said in great distress with a sigh that came straight from the heart, Where have you put him? They said, Lord, come and see. But Jesus wept and the Jews said, See how much he loved him. But there were some who remarked, he opened the eyes of the blind man. Could he not have prevented this man's death? Still sighing, Jesus reached the tomb. It was a cave with a stone to close the opening. Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha said to him, Lord, by now he will smell. This is the fourth day. Jesus replied, Have I not told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing my prayer. I knew indeed that you always hear me, but I speak for the sake of all these who stand around me so that they may believe it was you who sent me. When he had said this, he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, here, come out. The dead man came out, his feet and hands bound with bands of stuff and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, unbind him, let him go free. Many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Brothers and sisters, this evening, we celebrate the life of a man, a friend, a father, of a, and a, good, a very, very decent and good person. So much has been said about Winston this evening that I dare not say one thing more, lest you stone me or throw me out. But suffice it to say, brothers and sisters, Although he is dead, although he's in this coffin, his spirit lives on. You just have to look at the front pews here to see the beautiful family, beautiful children and grandchildren he's left behind. And indeed, his spirit lives on and will continue to do so. So to all of you, the family, I would like to express my sincere condolences but as I said, Winston has departed us, but he still lives with us. Brothers and sisters, Winston has gone. So this afternoon, the few words that I say will be addressed to you, to you and nobody else. In fact, I better use the opportunity to do it today, because on Sunday I doubt whether I'll see any of you probably see you at the next funeral. 
Well, brothers and sisters, the first, first reading tells you about a time for everything. And it goes on to say a time to be born, a time to die, and you name it, whatever. A time to kill, a time to heal. But brothers and sisters, when you read that passage, it gives you the impression that there's someone who has lived his whole life. He has done many things in his life, gone through the different phases. But here he is in his old age, reflecting on those days, but he finds a certain emptiness in him. He's relishing what he achieved, but there's an emptiness, brothers and sisters. And that emptiness is because there's the absence of God. Each of us, brothers and sisters, within us, there's always a deep hunger within us, within each one of us, a space that only God can fill. A space that only God can fill. The thing about this reading is so profound, yet it says a time for everything, but you notice there's no time for God. Who then was he? What did he want in his life? What else he needed? Brothers and sisters, this we have to reflect on our lives. What is it we crave for in this world? That is, we seem to push away everything that is of God and grasp for those things of the secular world. Fame, honor, sex, money, property. That's what we tend to grab for. Yet, I've gone to many a funeral and I've never seen a truck following the, ho the, the hearse carrying your stuff away. It, you can't take it away from you, brothers and sisters. You can't. We are going through a period in our country, a period which we haven't heard of for a long time, we haven't seen for a long time. All of us have read the news, have seen the things, the shootings, yesterday a drowning, and all these type of things that are happening in today's environment. We are hearing about drugs in schools, you name it. We have things like abortion on demand. All the things that are not of God, we are seeing. We therefore, as Grenadians, as a community of believers in God, have to sit back and reflect on those things. Because it does not take one or two. It does not take the government, it doesn't take the church. It takes all of us, all of us, to work together to make this place the Grenada we always knew and, and deter that which is not of God, which is becoming so prevalent in our country. We, brothers and sisters, have to do, do a little better with what we do. We must stop, brothers and sisters, ignoring the things that we think does not concern us, yet concerns our country, concerns the development of our country. There's things, brothers and sisters, that we can do to care for the less fortunate than ourselves. We, brothers and sisters, as I was reading last night or night before, when we have children, we have to be able to bring them closer to us. We must stop talking to children, at children, but rather with children. We must start talking with one another and not to one another. You get the message, I hope. I got the message when I read it. So brothers and sisters, this is why I chose this reading today. The reading of Lazarus having him dead. 
and there are certain messages that we all should carry with us in our lives. For instance, the first, three, first thing we hear is when Martha and Mary saw Jesus, they ran to him and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We have to ask ourselves, is God with us? Is Jesus with us? Is he with us so that we would not die to sin? Shouldn't we, brothers and sisters, ensure that in our families, in our homes, that there's a feeling that God is there, God is with you? We have pictures and things on the board, on the walls, but do we get a sense when we enter the house that God is in that house? When we go to work, what we do, what the work we do, do we find, do that work because God wants us to? Or is it for some other ultra motive? We therefore, brothers and sisters, from this reading must do like Martha, wish that in every aspect of our lives, God is there. And if he's not, we should crave to have him with us. And not only with us, but spread the word to those who are our friends and family, especially our children. Brothers and sisters, as we go on, Jesus asks the question, where have you put him? The response was, come and see. How often we've reached out to someone who you see is in problems. How often we reach out to them and tell them, come and see the word of God. Come and be part of the community of Christ. Come and be part of God's church, God's people. How often we've reached out to someone and asked them to join us in prayer. Not necessarily in church, could be anywhere. How often have we reached out to those less fortunate in ourselves? Less fortunate in ourselves and reached out to them. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot out there that we have to do. As Grenadians, if we really want our country to be the country we, that, that we, it's the envy of the world. Recently, in our church, we have a thing called Caritas, where we bring out goods for people. But what we did, we went to do, did a survey of the homes and the, the needy, not for those who want, but for the needy. And brothers and sisters, we went into a home. One lady, five children, lying on the ground with just some bedding on the ground. That was not the only case, brothers and sisters. There's a lot of it here. What did we do? Was well, straight away found a big enough mattress that could go into that, in that house and have them lying across on that mattress, subsequently finding beds for them and a bigger place. How often have we reached out to those people, brothers and sisters? This is what God has asked us to do. This is what is necessary to, to lift up our people from the whatever problems they've had, and not necessarily from sleeping on the floor, but other aspects of, in their, of need in their lives. But brothers and sisters, you know the sad thing about situations like this? is that when the man comes to visit the woman, the children are right there with him, with them. We also have the situation where husband and wives, or man and wife, sleeping in a room with the children. Why do you find that eventually men and daughter end up together? All of these things I'm saying, brothers and sisters, to shock you, I hope, shock you into the realization 
that we as Christians, we as Catholics particularly, have to do something to reach out to help those people. Right, I'm sure if Winston were here with me, as we've discussed it many times, would say, Amen. So, brothers and sisters, here in the reading, they tell, come and see. Let us all bring each other to see the plight of our people. Come together to, to be together in faith. Come together to love each other as Jesus loved us. And brothers and sisters, as you see here, in all aspects, there are people who criticize like the man. But Jesus comes to the grave and says, turn the stone away. Turn the stone that's blocking us from the good that there is out there. She says, Lord, is now is the fourth day. He will smell. Brothers and sisters, I tell you that my reading from this is an indication of your heart and your soul. When blocked by a stone or, or by, by prejudice or whatever, blocked there in your soul, filled with the nasty scent of sin, Sin, as I like to equate to the leprosy in the days of Jesus. Sin that eats away our souls, eats away our hearts, eats away our minds, our beings. That's leprosy of sin. And here it is. That stone is blocking that. And that stone, brothers, is our own prejudice, is our own indifference to life. It's our own neglect of what is of God, what is godly in this world. Yes, brothers and sisters, they took the stone away. Can you imagine that your soul and your heart is filled with sin, and through your sacrament of reconciliation, that stone is moved away, and the feeling of goodness, of happiness, of joy, replaces that stench of sin. Think of it, how you would feel, brothers and sisters. Yes, and Jesus calls Lazarus and tells us, come out. Having cleansed ourselves of sin, having got rid of all that stench, we are free, brothers and sisters, free to go out to God, to go out to a community, to go out to our families, to go out to our friends. Yes, brothers and sisters. This is the message we're getting here. That freedom of sin, that joy you get from be feeling I'm good in God's eyes. And here, when he comes out, he's still bound. And Jesus says, untie him, let him go free. Brothers and sisters, God has given us all freedom to do what we want, how we want. He's taught us how we should behave through the scriptures. Like Lazarus, they, 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 he was filled with sin but he's been reconciled to God, and therefore he's free again. Yes, brothers and sisters, the message we have here in this, in this reading tells us a story of ourselves, probably tells us of our Grenada, of what is wrong within it that we ourselves can change, we ourselves can make a difference. And brothers and sisters, as we go on in life, we have to always bear witness to the truth. Always bear witness to what is good and true. Always bear witness and always love our neighbor as Jesus loves us. Can you imagine a man 
a man suffering as he did, going on the cross, the nails going into his hands. Can you imagine how he felt? And was one of these nails your sin? Was it that sin that was being driven through his hands? Our brothers and sisters, he died for our salvation. But let us look at ourselves today. Let us look at our lives. Do we need him back again? When you have murder, abortion, you name it, going on in this world. Right? Do we need Jesus again? Or are we still driving nails in his hands and his feet? Are we still the, the lashes that are going on his back when they, they, latch, they tortured him? Are we pushing the thorns that were on his head? Brothers and sisters, it is time. It is time that we, brothers and sisters, really look at ourselves, especially at this time of Lent. Especially at this time of Lent, brothers and sisters, when we should reflect on our lives, rediscover in ourselves that childlike feeling of love that you had for your parents and for one another. Extend a happy hand to anyone. And if you find yourself in a dark place, brothers and sisters, if you find yourself lost and in a dark place, do as Jesus tells us, reach out your hand and he will lead you to a better place. Amen. Amen. Let us all stand. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for his church, confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord. We join our prayers to his. Your response is, Lord, hear our prayer. In baptism, Winston received the light of Christ, scattered the darkness now and lead him over the waters of death. Lord, in your mercy. Our brother Winston was nourished at the table of the Savior. Welcome him into the halls of the heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the family and loved ones of our beloved Winston. May they find solace and strength during this difficult period and help them find peace in the memories they share. Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray for our nation. We ask for your protection over our country and its people. Grant us strength and resilience in times of challenge. Help us to love one another and build a better future. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our government leaders. Give them the strength to lead our country with wisdom and compassion. Lord, in your mercy. Many friends and members of our families have gone before us and await the kingdom. Grant them an everlasting home with your son. Lord, in your mercy. Many people die by violence, war, and famine each day. Show your mercy to those who suffer so unjustly these sins against your love. 
and gather them to the eternal kingdom of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Those who trusted in the Lord now sleep in the Lord, like Winston. Give refreshment, rest, and peace to all whose faith is known to you alone. Lord, in your mercy. The family and friends of Winston seek comfort and consolation. Heal their pain and dispel the darkness and doubt that comes from grief. Lord, in your mercy. We are assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for our brother Winston. Strengthen our hope so that we may live in the expectation of your son's coming. Lord, in your mercy. And we ask our mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, to intercede on our behalf as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Lord God, giver and healer of souls, hear the prayers of Redeemer Jesus and the voices of your people, whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ, especially Winston White, and grant them a special place in your kingdom. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be seated, everyone.
Beloved, let us all stand and pray. God of loving kindness, listen favorably to our prayers, strengthen our belief that Jesus has risen from the dead, and I hope that your servant Winston will also rise again. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. As we are all looking forward to the coming of God's kingdom, let us all pray the prayer Jesus taught us. As we all pray together, our Father, who act in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you say to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Be seated.
Let us stand and pray. Dear Lord, we are mourning the passing of Michael Weston White. We thank you for the life and the service of Mr. White, who dedicated his time and energy to serve this nation. We ask for your mercy and forgiveness for any shortcomings he may have had, and we pray that you welcome him into your eternal kingdom with open arms. May he find eternal rest in your presence, free from pain and suffering. May his soul be surrounded by your love. We also pray for the family and the loved ones, asking for your comfort and strength to sustain them during this difficult time. Grant them consolation and comfort as they grieve the loss of their beloved father, uncle. We entrust him into your loving care. May he find eternal rest and happiness in your kingdom. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Trust in, in God. We have prayed together for Winston, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Winston again and enjoy his friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the face of Jesus Christ. We'll now pause for a while as we pray for Winston and indeed for ourselves.
Saints of God, come to his aid. Hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord. Receive his. May Christ who called you Winston take you to himself. May angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. Receive. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Winston in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed on Winston in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn towards us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with the assurances of faith. Until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brothers for ever. We ask this through Christ, O Lord. Winston, may the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, a new and eternal Jerusalem. May the choirs of angels welcome you and lead you to the bosom of Abraham. And where Lazarus is poor no longer, may you find eternal rest. For whoever believes in me, even though that person die, he shall live. In peace, brothers and sisters, let us now take our brother Winston to his place of rest. Ladies and gentlemen, just like to remind you that protocol will demand that you remain where you are so that the officials may exit the church before you do. So please, after the coffin, the officials will exit and then you may follow afterwards. Thank you. Also, I have been informed that after the body has been laid to rest, there will be refreshments available at the community center at Fur for the officials and at Shomi's place right next to the community center that will be for other persons who would have come here this afternoon to celebrate the life of Winston. So the officials will be at the community center and other people will be at Shomi's place right next to the community center. Again, please allow for the movement of the officials. Thank you. <laughs> 